Greetings again, everybody, and welcome to Arian's 200th Take Two. Joshua Jample back again with Alex Madembasi, Program Director with Arian Space. Hi. Hi, Josh. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to all of you, wherever you are in the world, watching our website, and welcome again to Kourou. We have a lot to talk about. Again, we're going to we'll go first, of course, to Area and Space Chairman and Chief Executive Jean-Yves Legal for a word on everything that took place with, since we last left you last night. Good evening. Second attempt for this historic 200th Ariane launch, which will orbit ATV-2 Johannes Kepler. It's the second attempt because, as you saw last night, during the final seven-minute fully automated countdown, the onboard computer spotted a difficulty. That is, a piece of information that was not what we expected, and the countdown was interrupted. As we're going to the International Space Station, we have to leave the ground at a specific instant, so there's no launch window. This is why we had to stop yesterday evening. Immediately after operations ceased yesterday, our teams started working to understand, analyze, and repair the origin of that difficulty. Now the Ariane 5 launcher has been fully restored to its operational condition and the countdown has started. If everything is all right, we should resume the final countdown seven minutes before launch. Launch is a little earlier tonight. Yesterday it was at 19 hours, 13 minutes, 57 seconds. And this evening it will be at 18 hours, 50 minutes, 55 seconds. If all runs well, we should start the final countdown, and I hope today we'll run it till the end. I leave you now to watch the Ariane 5 ES launch of ATV-2 Johannes Kepler. So with a short delay of uh, 24 hours, we're set to go with the first launch of the year, the 56th Ariane 5, and of course the 200th Ariane, the fourth launch in four months, as a matter of fact. Looking into the flight directorate here, Alex. Yes, the flight directorate, the board who took the decision to suspend the activities yesterday and to reschedule the launch since we had no launch window. It's not an easy decision to take, but most important is to keep the launcher and the satellite in safe conditions and good health. One day delay is not much compared to the importance of the ATV mission. We're now ready for launch. Ready for launch uh, coming up in 11 minutes for the first launch of the year. You saw Edward Perez there. Edward Perez is the uh, sort of the technical memory. The, the CTO of our space. Top technical person. You're going to be hearing next from the launch operations manager and the mission director all about the launcher campaign for Flight 200. Well, it is indeed a specific campaign because it is the 200th uh, iron launch. It started very early, immediately after flight uh, 197 last year. These hardworking teams were involved with assembly of the Ariane 5 since October of last year. They took advantage of the lessons learned from the first ATV flight. This saved time where work on the passenger was concerned. Flight 200, however, had certain restrictions, like all Ariane launches preceding it. We started with the preparation of ground facilities and of the launcher and uh, went on till the ATV-2 reached uh, the BAF. We also worked between Christmas and New Year to be ready to receive uh, uh, Johannes Kepler ATV-2. ATV-2 has a special cargo access device to load last-minute items. It's the first time the European Space Agency has used such an element. Over 400 kilograms will be loaded through the International Space Station hatch, with the ATV in the vertical position atop Ariane 5. This gives flexibility in adapting the cargo to the needs of the space station. Last-minute freight integration allows NASA to integrate the equipment necessary for the station as late as possible, knowing that nominally most of the freight is integrated three months before launch. Entering the module generates access constraints in terms of cleanliness and contamination. 
The European Space Agency implements procedures to make sure the operator's environment is fully compliant when he goes down into the module. Another restriction, this launch is programmed for a fixed liftoff time, no launch window. The last phase, that is the transfer of the, of the launch vehicle to the launch pad, followed by filling, requires full compliance with the schedule because tonight we have no launch window. After completing its final checks, Ariane 5 was given the green light to move to the launch zone. This transfer is done the day before liftoff. Riding on the launch table specially conceived for it, Ariane makes her way slowly on the rail track, pulled by a special truck, to its position on the launch pad. Here, it awaits the final countdown. And Ariane 5 awaiting the final countdown on this very cooperative effort tonight from the, all the European partners and beyond. And we'll be hearing from all of them uh, later on. But for now, Alex, the very green status panels. Yes. So tonight, we all hope that it'll stay green until the lift of time. So again, the panel showing the uh, health status of and the readiness status of not only the launcher itself, but also the ATV and all the different means of the launch base which are uh, participating to the launch tonight. The space base is a big one and all these services downrange, uh, telemetry, uh, safety, the satellites, uh, weather, all of them, sending their information here into Jupiter Mission Control, which is why we call it the nerve center of the space base. And they come in to, uh, two gentlemen whom uh, you're about to see, the mission director and the DDO, the range operations manager. And yes. there's the mission director. So Jean-Marc and uh, Damien, who are the key persons of the launch campaign. They are coordinating all the operations all throughout the launch campaign. From tous the DDO. Attention pour la séquence finale lanceur. The DDO who calls out the milestones in the campaign is going to call out the final automatic sequence at seven minutes. Top. H0 moins 7 minutes. All right, there we are. We made it into the final sequence, also called the automated uh, or automatic sequence. These are the final moments, I guess, of final countdown. Looking here into the program director area, Alex. Yes, uh, Christophe Bardou. Uh, just uh, some words on the uh, automatic sequence. The, uh, now, from now on, any activation of the launcher or any ground system is totally automatic and decided by the computers. Under the fairing tonight, 20 tons. The ATV, the second of six or seven ATVs going towards uh, the space station. Basically a cylinder, 10 meters by four and a half meters, 22 meters uh, with the uh, solar panels deployed. That comes at the very end of the mission about an hour from now. In two parts, basically, uh, there's a service module and a uh, cargo module service module with the propulsion systems, avionics, and also, I believe, some of the propulsion in there. Pro propellants, I should say. Propellants, yes. And, and the cargo, of course, bringing up uh, needed items to, uh, and supplies to the ISS. 20 tons in all. Shot of uh, Jupiter. Jupiter's in two parts. There's the uh, operationals. Here are the uh, program directors. This is your job, actually, isn't it? This is, yes, uh, the program director, uh, Christophe, and here is the counterpart so from the ATV, uh, Charlotte and uh, Nico Detman, the DMS. Uh, Christophe's work is the uh, uh, program director. He's handling the contracts uh, from signature up to, uh, up to the launch. Dealing with the customer. You're the customer interface. He's the customer's interface for Ariane Space. And that is your job. So you, you start on a new contract, uh, what, 18 months before liftoff? For a... Uh, Normal telecommunication satellite, it takes about 18 months to prepare uh, for a launch. Of course, for a scientific satellite, it may take much longer. That's a little different, yeah. And then, of course, you have all the reviews uh, after launch and everything. Yes, we have a very uh, accurate and uh, detailed analysis of all the flight data before the, the, before the next launch is taking place. So you're very busy. So I'm glad you took time to do the I, broadcast. I'm almost very busy. Thank you to remind me that, Josh. We, we saw under the fairing. Take a look, Alex, and uh, re read off some of the figures on the launch vehicle itself. Yeah, the two, the two big boosters, which are manufactured here in Kourou, well, uh, prepared and uh, assembled here in Kourou. The main stage, main cryogenic stage, the big stage with the cryogenic propellants. And the upper stage EPS. We'll talk a little bit more about this uh, stage uh, later. 
and on top of the EPS, the uh, VEB, the brains of the launcher, with all the electronics and onboard computer and EATV enveloped by the fairing, the long fairing. All right, coming up on four minutes, this is roughly where we got stuck uh, last night at four minutes and one second exactly. Yes, now we've passed the uh, pressurization of the propellant tanks, so the filling process has been stopped. We uh, had a last minute weather check at 10 minutes, didn't we, Alex? And they gave us a, a green for the weather? Yes, we had a green already at minus 20 minutes, uh, and uh, we'll have uh, very last. Uh, we had the last uh, weather report at minus 10 minutes, which was green as well. It was raining earlier in the day, but you can see the sky has cleared considerably, and uh, we should have fine weather for launch. We should have some fine pictures at liftoff on this very first launch of the year. Up at the Launch Control Center, what's going on? Uh, the Launch Control Center is now under the, uh, the heading of uh, Klaus Zell, our uh, Launch Operations Manager. He's uh, conducting the, uh, the Ariane Space Launch Team and uh, conducting the last operations and monitoring uh, everything which is uh, going on happening on, on the launch vehicle. They monitor all the checks that uh, take Arian down to liftoff, not beyond. Is that right? Yes, they monitor all the uh, all what's happening on the launcher and all the uh, the um, information coming from the different checks. Now, how many people are up there? I know there are three teams. How many Around people? Around 150 cost? people, maybe 200, including all the people in charge of the ground installations maintenance. I think there are three teams basically up there coordinating the campaign and the countdown, guaranteeing flight readiness. Yeah, there may be even two teams preparing for two different launch campaigns because we can prepare our launcher for the next flight and while being uh, about to, uh, to uh, finish the uh, campaign uh, of the previous one. All that taking place about 14 kilometers uh, away from here where we are in Jupiter. You can see Arian on the pad. Coming up on two minutes, we're still green. That's the color we're we still want. green, which is very good news. What's happening now? Now what's happening is that we have the very last uh, uh, operation on the launch vehicle which will progressively uh, become totally autonomous from the ground uh, systems. This is what basically happens during the synchronized sequence the, from the seven minutes down to liftoff is power, am I right in saying power passes from the ground control over to autonomous onboard computer control? Absolutely. Okay, so that is what's happening now. Uh, if we bring the camera back into Jupiter, you'll see people starting to wander out onto the terraces. There they are. They're going out. There are two terraces on either side of us here, observation decks, and the VIPs and invited guests uh, go out there usually about this time, and they have a uh, bird's eye view of the launcher lifting off, passing right over our heads on her way. The DDO will call out the one-minute mark in just a moment, and we'll be into the final 60 seconds of Flight 200. Attention pour H0-1 minute. Top H0-1 minute. All right, we're into the final 60 seconds of the first launch of the year. You remember, you can follow all the action on the website. You have the uh, address right there. The ignition sequence, tell us about that, Alex. You'll hear the DDO call out of allumage, yes, which you'll, is ignition. You'll, you'll, see the, you'll see the flame under the uh, main engine, Vulcan. So we shall ignite the, uh, the engine and check it for seven seconds. That's the main engine. That's the main engine. And when it's, everything's fine and with the, the, the check is okay, then uh, the ignition of the boosters and the uh, actual liftoff. Okay, so you get main engine lights up first, computers check out for seven seconds, all the pressure, testing it on the ground, and then the, the uh, boosters go. We'll let the DDO we'll call out the final uh, countdown and be back after Ariane has cleared the tower. A tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, unité. Top, allumage vulcain. Confirmé. Top, allumage EAP, décollage. Les paramètres avant sont normaux. Beautiful oh, there, Ariane off on her way with just a 24-hour delay, leaving a trail of gold as she rises into the sky over uh, French Guiana at 18.51 local time and right on time 
Ariane began her mission. And right on time. So we had a, a mass at liftoff of 773 tons, including 554 tons for the sole boosters. The boosters, which give a very strong initial acceleration that will increase velocity from zero to 7,200 kilometers per hour in about 2.3 minutes. That's 4,500 miles per hour. So after booster separation, which will occur in about two minutes, uh, the launcher will have lost about 75% of its liftoff mass. The boosters will fall down into the Atlantic Ocean in a zone which has been secured by an international advice to uh, maritime navigation. Ariane burning now five tons of fuel per second. That's two and a half tons in each booster per second. The EPC, also the core stage, as it's called, is burning another 300 kilos of fuel per second. All that adds up to roughly the equivalent of a dozen Airbuses. She's now following the program in the onboard computer, which gives all the orders, including stage separations, which we will soon see. Four powered flight phases tonight. We're in the first one, the main engine and the boosters, and the boosters, as Alex said, they're going to burn for another maybe 20 seconds. Alex, take a look on the left, the upper left screen. Can you give us a description of the curve, please? Yeah, we, s we see the uh, simulated flight trajectory, which is computed by using very accurate mathematical models of the launcher and the ATV, and by application, of course, of the Keplerian laws for the ballistic phase. Which we're going to hear about a little later. A little later. All three of them. So the mark which follows... Ah. DDO has just called out the separation of the boosters. You can see what that looks like. There's another one out of camera range on the left, but they fall back down right on time at about uh, 64 kilometers up, I think. They fall away from the shore. People streaming back in uh, from the terraces, you can see in the background there. Yes, now to follow the, the actual flight. And now we're expecting the uh, fairing separation. That's the next milestone. Minutes. You can see the cursor crawling up on the upper left. I don't, don't know if you can read it. Sep quaff, it says, separation of the fairing. On the lower left, Alex, can you uh, describe what the, what the bottom lines are? Yes, we have the real-time information from the launcher of the uh, velocity and the altitude, and also the uh, uh, angle of the uh, telemetry antenna with respect to horizontal. So you see the altitude, uh, the, the altitude is 102 kilometers, that's the second line, so we're above the atmosphere, which is where we can separate the fairing, and the uh, DDO will call out that milestone in a moment. We are in the second. Largage de la coiffe. There it is. Largage there de la There it is. So we don't, we don't need the, uh, the protection of the fairing uh, anymore. We have cross the atmospheric layers and then uh, now we don't need this uh, two tons weight anymore. There are actually two halves, one half like one of the boosters before was out yeah, of Yeah, it's uh, cut vertically and range. horizontally. Everything is perfect on board, says the DDO. The ATV now under the fairing exposed to the elements. And uh, we're going to go now to the next part of the broadcast, which is the latest news from Ariane Space, and there is a lot of it. So take a look. Ariane ended 2010 in style with its sixth successful launch on December 29th, delivering two telecommunication satellites, Hispasat 1E for Spain and Koreasat 6 for South Korea. It was the 41st straight successful mission for the European launch vehicle. 2010 was a big year for Ariane Space with 12 contracts signed for Ariane and 7 for Soyuz. In all, six successful launches for a total of 12 satellites. 2011 promises to be as big, with Soyuz and Vega bringing their launch services to the space base. Tokyo, January 19th. During the EJBRT roundtable of Japanese and European industrialists, Jean-Yves Le Gall met with the Japan's Prime Minister, Naoto Kan. The meeting underscored strengthening cooperation between Europe and Japan in matters of space research and in commercial space. UTELSAT is signed with Ariane Space to launch one of its new satellites in 2012. This is the 26th contract between the two partners. Jean-Yves Le Gall and Dr. Volker Liebig of the European Space Agency also signed for launch of Sentinel-1A, an environmental monitoring satellite, for December of next year. Baikonur, January 28, the Soyuz once again successfully lifted off from the Kazakhstan base. It was launch number 1,766 of the legendary vehicle. Meanwhile, here in French Guiana, Soyuz is preparing for her maiden voyage, set for the second half of this year. Work on the launch pad is nearly complete. Vega 2 is set for her first flight. Qualification tests continue here in French Guiana. 
We are now in the stage of combined tests to be completed by the end of June. The mechanical tests are completed. The launcher module is now integrated into the Vega gantry. The electric tests are completed up to 50 percent. Now remain the fluid tests within the, with the filling of the Avon, the fourth stage of Vega, with its own propellants. Very delicate phase which will take place under the responsibility of Ariane Espace in French Guiana. During those next few months, the launch system review should also take place. The steering committee is planned for the end of June. The date of the qualification flight campaign will then be known. It's planned for the early summer. The docking with the first Vega flight is flight for the autumn of this year. So let's keep our fingers crossed and in good luck, Vega. Ciao. We are in the second of the powered flight phases. The uh, main yeah. engine burning alone, it'll burn for between eight and nine minutes. Yeah, it will have burnt about uh, 149 tons of liquid oxygen and 25 tons of hydrogen. And then le let's learn more about the uh, trajectory by Alexis Macaire. Tonight's flight is using an Ariane 5 ES version. Storable propellant aboard the upper stage will allow it to reignite several times, something essential for placing ATV-2 into its final orbit. Unlike the other standard GTO flights carried out with an A5 ECA launcher with only one ignition of the upper stage, here with the ATV there will be two ignitions of the upper stage separated by a 45 minute long ballistic phase. The first EPS boost will last 10 minutes. It is carried out above the Atlantic Ocean within reach of the Santa Maria station in the Azores. At the end of this EPS-1 boost, the launcher is already in a stable orbit, with a perigee at 140 kilometers and an apogee at 260. This flight will go on above Europe, then Asia, until Australia. The EPS is ignited again. The EPS-2 boost will last 30 seconds, and it will then reach the orbit targeted for this mission, 260 kilometer circular altitude. After the EPS-2 boost, the composite enters a stabilization phase. This stabilization phase will let the ATV control center in Toulouse make contact with the ATV-2. Then separation can occur. On its own, the ATV will circle the Earth for a week before catching up with the space station 22,000 kilometers ahead of it. It will then have reached an altitude of 350 kilometers and be ready to dock. You heard Alexi uh, in the film talking about the Santa Maria ground station. That's an ESA tracking station, rather new one, joined the system in 2008. Not used a lot, but it was used for ESA's Envisat, which was launched by Arian in 2002, Flight 145. And it's going to be used also to receive launcher telemetry for the upcoming Galileo GPS launches on Ariane or Soyuz from the space base. The DDO has just called out the extinction of the lower stage and the separation of the lower stage. You can see what that looks like up there. Waiting for the ignition of the upper stage. The first upper stage burn. There it is. He's called it out. There right it is. Time. Those are three commands given by the onboard computer. Extinction of the lower stage, separation of the lower stage, ignition upper stage in about uh, 12 or 13 seconds. And this is the normal everything normal. He, sa he says the first ignition will burn for about eight minutes. There are, there are actually three burns. Two of them concern the ATV. One of them does not. It comes about an hour after our broadcast. I don't think we're going to be here. But the lower composite has done its work now. The launcher reaching its targeted position for extinction of the main engine. Everything OK on board? Yes, the, uh, the EPS. The EPS I I is burning. It's used uh, on this ES version for its capability to be reignited during the flight and then to perform the two boosts which are necessary for the ATV mission before a third one which will uh, which will be the re-entry into the atmosphere and destruction of the uh, of the upper stage leaving no debris in space but now we are listening to Jean-Jacques Dordain director general of ESA
Johannes Kepler is the second ATV. Jules Verne was the first one. It was a great achievement. But this one is a production ATV, which makes a big difference, since it's the first of four to leave over a one-year period. It's an exceptional and unique vehicle for ESA, because it's partly a launcher, a spacecraft, partly an orbiting infrastructure. And even though it's an automatic vehicle, it's compatible with a crude infrastructure. It's also a unique vehicle for the station because it's the heaviest truck bringing freight on board and which automatically docks with the station with great accuracy. It's the outcome of a tremendous work undertaken in industry all over Europe under the leadership of Astrium in Bremen for the production part. It's also a cooperation with partners since we need all the partners of the station, especially the Russian partner, since we dock with the Russian part of the station. And indeed, it's also the outcome of the continuous support uh, of all the member states. And I'd like to thank them all for their support and their patience for this exceptional event. Six minutes left in the upper stage's first burn. Ariane performing flawlessly. You can see on the bottom left, our altitude is 146 kilometers and our speed is 7.2 kilometers per second. Johannes Kepler, Alex, he gave his name to the mission tonight. Tell yes, us a little he, bit about him. He was born in 1571 in Germany. He's a contemporary of Nicolas Copernicus and Tycho Brahe. Uh, he's a German mathematician, astronomer, and astrologer, and a key figure of the 17th century scientific revolution. He has already proved himself at the age of 28 as being a superb mathematician and earned a reputation as a skillful astrologer as well. And we're going to have a look at his three basic laws coming up that's coming up a little bit later on for now another film on the ATV a look about what it's carrying six hundred kilograms heavier than the Jules Verne which had itself established a record this second ATV is the heaviest spacecraft that Europe has ever launched this is largely due to a performance increase of Ariane 5 with its new welded boosters already used several times on Ariane space commercial flights. But the overall ATV capacity has been increased. The eight internal racks of its cargo carrier section have been redesigned and optimized in weight and volume. Depending on ISS requirements and on solar activity, the average ATV loading turns around six tons. But the Johannes Kepler will do much better. The current manifest is that we are uploading 7.1 ton. Um, it will be fully loaded almost up to the last gram. On this manifest, 1,600 kilograms of dry cargo. It includes 435 kilos of food, 70 of astronauts' belongings, ESA's GeoFlow experiment to study convective flow patterns of liquids, and spare parts for ESA's Columbus Laboratory and for NASA's ISS modules. Also loaded three video cameras to be used for ESA physiology experiments and several liquid waste boxes to store non-reusable parts of the station's water system and for public relations, a few stickers. Most of the dry cargo was loaded last September. However, this second ATV mission will make use for the first time of its late accessibility. 28 different bags, some 430 kilograms, to be added at the last moment. Since we have closed the back entrance of the ATV, the late cargo loading takes place in the final assembly hall. We will open the Russian docking system interface and the, the person will descend into the ATV through the hatch and then will stow these bags in, this, in their designated locations. The bulk of the cargo, however, is propellant. Except for the water tanks remaining empty on this mission, the other reservoirs are brim full. Four and a half tons of propellants to reboost the ISS, 850 kilograms of fuels to transfer into the Russian FGB module and 100 kilos of gases, air, oxygen and nitrogen. 
Everyone remembers the pictures of the streaking debris when the Jules Verne disintegrated as it plunged towards the Pacific Ocean. The perfectly controlled re-entry had been monitored and filmed by two aircraft. No aerial surveillance this time, but on its descent the Johannes Kepler will have an unusual passenger, a 4 kilogram, 30 centimetre diameter conical Pico satellite will record and send back to Earth details of the breakup, recording the ultimate moments of the second ATV mission. Alex, we're in the upper stage burn, and this version of the area and its upper stage is called the ES. Now, how is the ES yes. different than the so others? So, the, the EPS upper stage was so used for the very first versions of the Ariane 5. Uh, and uh, it uses storable propellant instead of cryogenics. And uh, the engine has the capability of being reignited, which is not the case for the uh, upper stage ESC with the cryogenic uh, oxygen and hydrogen. So um, we kept the, uh, after we decided to have only one version with the powerful uh, cryogen full cryogenic uh, launcher, we decided to keep this uh, stage for specific missions and especially for the ATV missions. So uh, this capability of several boosts uh, is uh, aiming at uh, reaching this very specific orbit of the uh, of the ATV, which is inclined at 52 degrees. So we need the reignitable upper stage for this mission. Yes. As as we mentioned, there are going to be three upper stage burns. The first one is uh, very shortly going to be shut down. You'll hear the DDO call that out. And there it is. That's about, at uh, 17, about, about nine minutes of uh, burn. And the second one will be very short, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, yeah, that comes... Uh, in 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 phase All right, we're, we're into the, what they call the ballistics yeah, yeah. phase. <coughs> À présent, la première partie de la mission d'Ariane 5 ES est mission is over, and now the ballistic phase starts. The EPS, the storable propellant stage of Ariane 5 in the ATV2 Johannes Kepler, will soon fly over Europe, Southeast Asia, and Australia for 42 minutes as a whole. Then the EPS, the upper stage, will will uh, be ignited again during four minutes, and at 19 hours 54, ATV-2 Johannes Kepler will be separated from Ariane 5. So see you in something like 45 minutes to see the second part of the mission. Okay, there we are. And uh, the second part of the mission is going to begin with a film on uh, the lessons learned from the first ATV-1, which went up, of course, in 2008, and the ESA and Arian Space and all the other partners put those lessons to good use for this uh, launch. Launch teams from Arian Space and ESA took advantage of experience gained from the first ATV mission to make today's run more smoothly, and Arian's experience in launching commercial satellites has allowed it to meet the record performance demanded by the 20-ton ATV-2. Même si elle est sensiblement Even plus complexe, this mission la mission de ce soir a bénéficié de l'expérience acquise au fil des lancements commerciaux et acquise lors de la mission ATV1. La principale différence est la masse d'ATV, 20 tonnes et 60 kg pour ATV2. Alors que ATV1 ne pesait que 19 350, ceci est le résultat d'amélioration de performance à intervenue en portant sur le lanceur. En particulier, à l'issue du lancement d'ATV1, nous avons effectué toute une série de retours d'expérience, que ce soit pour les opérations au CSG ou pour l'analyse des missions. Ceci a largement contribué à fluidifier la préparation de cette mission et tout ceci resservira, bien entendu, pour la préparation des missions ATV suivantes, en particulier à TV3 dès l'année prochaine. The ATV is a supreme technical achievement but also a great human adventure and one that's brought together people and partners from around the world. Well, regarding ATV, the, the main equipment suppliers are coming from 10 European countries plus US and Russia. Uh, the small ESA ATV team is composed of uh, nine different nationalities, so I hardly can imagine a project which is more multicultural than uh, ATV. Uh, and that's actually why, why I love the project and uh, what makes it very interesting and efficient. The ATV is Europe's contribution to the International Space Station and one that has mobilized the entire international space community. 
So, uh, as you know, the ATV is part of uh, the ISS exploitation program. It is actually part of the so-called US segment of the International Space Station, but it is docking to the Russian part of the, of the station. Um, to, and we need also other vehicles like Japanese vehicles and Russian vehicles in order to maintain this project, which is uh, the largest international project which has uh, ever been created by uh, human beings. Alex, uh, the ballistics phase involves a telemetry loss, as I understand it. <coughs> yes, we're flying over uh, Europe, and then uh, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and then uh, Asia, and uh, to reach Australia. Uh, all along this track, we don't, don't, do not have ground stations, and then uh, we um, will have no uh, telemetry signals. But so that's you normal. That's, that's planned for. Absolutely right? normal. So you will see that the... Uh, the numbers at the upper left uh, is we'll, frozen. We'll get back to the numbers, but uh, tonight's scientific mission is the latest in a long series, and we're going to take a look at a film that recaps those. Ariane Space, the world leader in launch services and solutions, also leads the way in space science. It has contributed to scientific research ever since its second flight back in 1980 and it continues to serve the scientific community. Since then, the Ariane family has launched dozens of satellites, probes, and spacefaring ships that have helped expand our knowledge of fields as diverse as astronomy, the magnetosphere, ocean currents and their circulation, the study of comets, general Earth observation and the environment, and meteorology. These satellites had names like Giotto, Hipparchus, Rosetta, Herschel Planck, Envisat, XMM, Topix Poseidon, and the Spot Series. Whether in Earth orbit or in Sun synchronous orbit, these valuable payloads have helped place Europe at the forefront of contemporary science. They have given us invaluable building blocks for the future study of not only our own planet, but the entire cosmos as well. From the first Ariane 1s to today's powerful Ariane 5, Ariane space continues to play its part in our ongoing quest for achievement in all fields of scientific discovery. Alex, you got interrupted uh, on your story of the telemetry loss. Go ahead, because it's very important. Yes, so I said that there is no uh, ground stations all along the track, but uh, due to the fact that we have a ballistic phase, we know exactly where the launcher is, and we know exactly when we shall recover it uh, with this signal. Uh, we have uh, a mass memory on board, which uh, records all the flight data, and we shall recover them when we get the uh, telemetry signal in Australia. And all this data will be downloaded for further uh, analysis. And that comes afterward. It doesn't come in real time. Is that right? In real time, we record on board, and then uh, we shall download. Okay, more on the ground st stations tracking the Ariane 5 and ATV, the subject of our next film. After liftoff, the launcher and its passenger may be lost to casual observers but they are closely followed by teams around the world, with ground stations gathering radar and telemetry signals, giving vital information on both launcher and passenger. The launcher must be monitored for the whole propulsion phase, starting from the coast of French Guiana and Gallio telemetry stations to get all the data from the launcher. Then we set up a naval station located on a boat, MN Toucan, which belongs to Ariane Espace, which is exactly halfway between the Azores and here, 
Then we fly over the Azores when we have the first EPS extinction. From then on, we are in the ballistic phase uh, for about 45 minutes. During the ballistic phase, we have the support of DGA. Their radars will give us excellent visibility of the position of the launcher. DGA, the French MOD, is a long time and privileged partner of CNES in space activities, especially for military programs like Helios, for which CNES will be delegated project manager for the space part of the program. Once we leave the DGA visibility, we go on to the Perth visibility in Australia, then Warrior in New Zealand. And we had to set up a station in Warrior, New Zealand, to have visibility of the second EPS propulsion phase and the separation of the ATV. You know, it's original because it highlights the planetary and human dimension of this campaign. Also, the fact the antenna was set up by our partner, OTB in South Africa, an African antenna with Iron 5 reception equipment from CSG. This highlights the human dimension of this campaign. All right, Alex, you uh, told us all about Kepler's life earlier. Now let's hear about his laws. Law number one. Law number one. In Kepler's time, everyone believed, including Copernicus, that orbits should be perfect circles but a circle is in fact an ellipse with very low eccentricity. So it was not obvious that the orbits are elliptical. Thanks to detailed calculations for the orbit of Mars, Kepler deducted its elliptical shape and inferred that other celestial bodies, even farther away from the Sun, have elliptical orbits too. All right, that's the first law. The second and the third laws coming up a little more. But for now, tonight, tonight's law represents a partnership with the Arian Space and Industrial Partner EADS and an interview with their chairman. Today is a great day for Astrium since we have a conjunction of two events. The first one is the 200th Ariane launch after 41 successes running. Astrium can be proud of this success. And this is not just sheer luck. This is the fruit of a quite extraordinary and long industrial work done all over Europe to ensure the launcher reliability and performance under the responsibility of Astrium, Ariane prime contractor. I would like to take this opportunity to really thank from the bottom of my heart the women and men who are at the origin of this extraordinary success at Astrium and in all European industry. But let me also thank the European Space Agency and the national agencies, in particular CNES and DLR, that have made this success possible. They have trusted us and provided the means for that success. The second event is the launching of the second ATV Johannes Kepler, after the extraordinary success of the docking of the first ATV, Jules Verne. Again, let me thank the Astrium teams, of course, the ATV prime contractor, and all our partners all over Europe. So, Ariane, the ATV, uh, these are two examples of the European space industry, of its exceptional technological expertise. I want to really thank the European governments governments who have launched this human adventure of Europe in space. I say launched because this European adventure in the conquest of space is just starting. This is the beginning of all that space can offer to the men and women of Europe. So let us go on now. Let us develop Ariane further. Let us learn all the ATV lessons in particular. You can really believe in our ambition. You can trust us. Et vous pouvez nous faire confiance.
All right, Alex, uh, Kepler's first law, elliptical orbits. The second law, I think, is a little harder to describe. Good luck. A bit more difficult. The, the line joining a planet and the sun sweeps over equal areas during equal intervals of time. This, of course, perfectly applies to the motion of a satellite around the Earth. It simply means acceleration of the satellite towards the perigee and deceleration towards the apogee. The velocity is not constant on an ellipse. Uh, except for the particular case of a circular orbit, the geostationary satellites. All right, you did very well. The ATV has its own control center in Toulouse, and that's the subject of our next film. Take a look. Since the earliest days of space flight, the French space agency CNES has accumulated a significant expertise, not only in the conception of satellites and manned space flights, but particularly in all aspects of spacecraft operations in orbit. The creation of the ATV control center was decided in 1998 and installed in 2002 at the CNES Technical Center in Toulouse. It has the responsibility of conducting, on behalf of the European Space Agency, the coordination of all in-flight phases of the automated transfer vehicle. The Toulouse Centre coordinates all the control facilities involved in an ATV mission. Those related to ISS operations, like the NASA one in Houston or the Russian one in Moscow, not forgetting the astronauts themselves in the International Space Station and also the ESA Ground Network Control Center hosted in the Columbus Center in Germany. The inaugural flight of the ATV in 2008 required two demonstration days to validate the vehicle's automatic rendezvous and docking technology and its collision avoidance maneuvers. A Jules Verne mission patch prominently displayed today in Houston testifies to that first mission's success. OK, it's anecdotal, but it proves that the ATV is now truly part of the Houston Center, but moreover that it's entered into this restricted sphere of manned spaceflight activities. For each mission, the ATVCC draws up with its partners the mission timeline and the complex procedures and validates all the required control systems. After launch and release of the spacecraft, it tracks every phase of the flight, including the rendezvous and docking with the ISS. This covers, for instance, the monitoring of the solar array and antenna deployment, and the firing of the ATV's engines to change and raise its orbit to that of the orbital outpost. Preparing an ATV mission can take one year, and with the Johannes Kepler mission being the first in a series of regular flights, and with new engineers joining the teams, CNES and ESA have this last year geared up to the prospect of these recurrent missions. We've created what we call a training academy, which is a set of classes, practical and theory, individual lessons and as a team, which include rehearsals with our partners, so that we are ready to conduct these operations. Come the day, the engineers at each console can react instinctively to any incident, in harmony with their colleagues, and totally calm, however difficult a situation may be. At the end of the mission, the teams at the ATVCC will supervise the vehicle's undocking, and they will initiate the last maneuvers which safely deorbit the spacecraft, entailing its disintegration in the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean. Even if numerous safety measures have been built in, there is still tension in the control rooms for each phase of the flight. It will never become a routine job particularly as human lives, that of the ISS crew, is involved. But it is also, for all concerned, a magical moment. Wow. It's magical to experience the sight of an ATV approaching the space station in real time on a big screen, in a control room that is vibrating at the speed of the ATV itself. Even when I watch those pictures again from two years ago, I have shivers down my spine, so I can't imagine anyone else reacting differently, particularly those for whom it's the first time.
Alex, you are go for explanation of Kepler's third law. Number three. Yes. So, third law was published uh, by Kepler in 1619. It says that the square of the period of revolution of a planet is proportional to the cube of its mean distance from the sun. So you can easily, from your kitchen, preparing your breakfast, calculate the time of a complete revolution of a satellite around the Earth. That's pretty good. I, th I think I've got that now. The third laws about revolutions on the Earth. Very well done. Let's give it a try. I'm <laughs> <laughs> a film now on another partner, NASA's work on the space station. You'll be hearing from Michael Cifredini, their program director. It's really interesting what's happened over the years since the, uh, since the partnership was formed and we started building the ISS. Uh, in the early years, the U.S. expected that the, that the shuttle would fly uh, for the entire life of the, uh, of the, of the ISS. With the, with the decision to retire the shuttle and, and to move on to other systems uh, for resupply, uh, the ATV has become a critical part of our capability, uh, whereas before it was important to have uh, particularly the propulsion capability that it carried, uh, largely it was redundant to what, uh, what shuttle could otherwise fly to ISS. So when the decision was made several years ago to retire the, the shuttle, um, both ATV and, uh, and the Japanese version, the HTV, became uh, critical parts of our logistics resupply. And the, and the vehicles that we procure uh, in the U.S. to supply the ISS supplies basically the, the balance of what is remaining after the ATV and the HTV do uh, their function. So in that sense, it's become critical to the well-being of ISS. And as we evolve ISS and, and keep it on orbit for, for many years, we will, the, the one thing is certain, we'll have to continue to resupply. And a consistent resupply chain is mandatory for the health and well-being and, and the utilization of, of ISS. And so um, when, when people ask the question, what, what do you think of, what, what role does a vehicle like ATV play to ISS? It's, it's a simple answer, and it's not being uh, dramatic. We can't survive without these vehicles, and ATV is a key part of that. Um, and so uh, for the livelihood of the ISS, in order to keep six crew on board and have them do all the research that we need them to do with the platform that we all built in low Earth orbit, uh, we have to have the ATV um, there uh, doing the job that we're relying on it to do. Uh, to date, it's done very well, and we would expect uh, the remaining vehicles to do uh, just as well. We look forward to having it on orbit. Alex, we mentioned some of the lessons learned from the ATV-1 going into tonight's launch. Can you elaborate? Yes, we have a lot to learn from each campaign. So the lessons learned from ATV-1 qualification flight uh, have permitted to improve the operational procedures and to overcome the technical difficulties that were encountered at that time. This is a typical way of always improving our knowledge by taking lessons from experience. We have implemented a quality management process which addresses specifically the lessons learned aspects with, its cu with the customers. All right, this uh, ATV-2 is eagerly awaited by the astronauts on board the ISS, and they sent us this message from space. Watch this. I think you'll find it interesting. The other reason the ATV is very important to us is because it, uh, unlike some of the other vehicles, like the uh, HTV and the uh, commercial vehicles, it, it provides a capability to reboost uh, the space station to adjust its orbit uh, and also for debris avoidance. So it's very, very important to the uh, International Space Station. As a crew, we're really looking forward to having the ATV come aboard. It's a bit different than the, our next supply ship, which is the Japanese supply ship, or HTV, in, in that the HTV is a, a ship that comes up, approaches the space station, hovers in place outside the space station, and then Paolo and I will capture that um, HTV with the robotic arm and then attach it to the space station. Now, ATV 
is an autonomous vehicle that docks to the space station without the robotic arm. And I'll let Paolo tell you about that. ATV it's a very points the way to the future because uh, it looks like technology that we really need to develop if we want to go beyond uh, the moon and, uh, and go uh, towards Mars and everything. We need to be autonomous. Uh, we need to rely on the machine being capable of carrying out this very important uh, task. Uh, in fact, uh, the rendezvous is extremely complex. And when you see such a big uh, spacecraft uh, arriving towards the station uh, at a precise uh, distance from the target, it, 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 you really f figure out how important it is to be uh, capable of doing this uh, activity in a good way. Um, of course, uh, we are expecting ATV because uh, it has a lot of supplies for the station, but also because it contains a lot of personal items, clothing for us. So we are really waiting for this uh, vehicle to come, and we really would like to thank the European industries and the European engineers that have uh, designed and built this uh, vehicle. We'd like to thank the launch team that is there in, in uh, Guyana uh, launching the vehicle and the team that is in Toulouse, uh, uh, ESA, Ariane Spas, uh, all the teams that are there uh, working all together for this vehicle. So a little fun in space from our astronauts on board uh, the ISS. There are six of them on board now. Those were the three. You saw Paolo Nespoli speaking last on the left. He's uh, from Italy. The first time a European astronaut is on board for uh, on board the ISS for a, uh, an ATV mission. There was no European astronaut three years ago for the Jules Verne. The European astronauts train at the European Astronauts Center in Germany. It's outside of Cologne, Köln, if you speak German. They've been making regular visits to the ISS ever since about uh, 2001, I think. And we've had German and Italian and French and Spanish and Belgian and Dutch and Swedish astronauts. More on the ISS on this film. We'll be back. Last November, the International Space Station, with its 14 modules, its maze of corridors, living quarters and laboratories, celebrated its 10th anniversary. Its assembly practically finished, 2001 marks a turning point for the orbital complex and its international partners. To maximize its use, there's now a consensus to keep it flying for at least another decade. Europe, for its part, with its Columbus Laboratory, the Multipurpose Logistics Module, the Node 3 Connecting Module, and its Cupola Observation and Control Tower, is eager to fully exploit with its astronauts all the benefits of this facility in orbit. And the ATV is a key element in this strategy. We are talking here about the biggest international space program which has ever been uh, designed and ATV is the mean in order to pay our debts for the fact that uh, our US partners are operating Columbus for us. So it's an obligation and it's a responsibility uh, and we need in total at least uh, five ATVs in order to pay this debt. Uh, that includes Chauvin and we are on the discussion whether we need another one uh, for the ISS extension. With the Space Shuttle retiring soon, Europe's automated transfer vehicle will be the largest logistics vehicle for the ISS. Until alternative craft become available, there will also be the Russian Soyuz to ferry astronauts to and from the station, and two space freighters, the Russian Progress and the Japanese HTV. But with its six to seven ton capacity, the ATV can load three times more cargo than a Progress. And the HTV has to be grappled and manually docked to the ISS. So the automated ATV is the most valuable asset for the continued operation of the space station, particularly when it is permanently occupied by six astronauts. The arrival at this time of the Johannes Kepler mission is of paramount importance for the ISS. Since the shuttle has an interest to provide high upload, the ISS is flying a bit lower in order to allow sh shuttle to bring as much as payload to the ISS. So now with the shuttle retiring, ISS will be lifted and this will be done by ATV and it's in a significant lift of about 30 kilometers which ATV2 has to provide. ESA astronaut Paolo Nespoli will be fully involved in these operations and particularly in monitoring the docking. 
The ATV-2 is the first of a series of closely spaced recurrent missions. Indeed, flight directors at the French Space Agency in Toulouse are already preparing for the third ATV, christened Eduardo Amaldi, which is programmed for the spring of next year. Production-wise, the prime contractor, EADS Astrium, currently has two other vehicles on order after ATV-3. ESA, with its member states, has started examining a proposal to budget for an additional vehicle. If Europe and its partners are to pursue medical, scientific and technology research in this orbital facility, and in future years use it as a staging post to send manned missions to the moon and further into space, then there are few real alternatives to adequately service the International Space Station during the next few years. Well, back in the uh, Jupiter uh, Center, and uh, you can see that uh, everyone is very concentrated on the uh, on the mission. Uh, we are waiting for the uh, telemetry signal to come back, uh, and it will be the acquisition of the telemetry signal by the Adelaide Australian Station Ground Station. Uh, it, we shall have ignition of the second ignition of the EPS in about ten minutes. And uh, for the moment, you can see that all the information on the upper left uh, corner of the screen is still uh, frozen uh, until the telemetry is recovered by the station. So a recap of the launch. We have the perfect launch right on time, although uh, a bit cloudy weather. We could see uh, the launcher and the boosters propulsion with separation here, separation of the two boosters and then the EPC uh, main thrust before separation of the two halves of the fairing which protects the ATV during the atmospheric uh, flight and after this uh, the uh, EPC which uh, thrust is obtained by the Vulcan 2 engine after separation of the main EPC uh, stage we have the ignition of the EPS upper stage on top of which we have the ATV which is attached to its uh, cylindrical uh, adapter and then extinction of we have a little time in the broadcast tonight we don't always but it's a special occasion and we thought we'd take about 10 minutes to find out more about this marvelous machine which is the ATV how it works and how it's going to rendezvous and dock when it meets uh, the space station and for all that we thought well who better to ask than this gentleman right here this is Jean-Francois Clairvoy of ESA the European Space Agency he's a former astronaut he flew three missions on the US shuttle and he played a very important role in the design and the development of the ATV particularly where the astronauts are going to be involved in its use. Jean-Francois, thanks for being with us. Bonsoir. Now, with us, of course, also you can see a model of the ATV. Now, Jean-Francois, before you take us on a guided tour and show us where everything is and how it's going to work and how it's going to dock, fill us in first on what exactly your role was in the design of, I think you call it, the ATV astronaut interface. Yeah, you may wonder why an astronaut was involved, although it's an unmanned vehicle, but of course, when it docks to the space station and when it is used on board, the crew is concerned. And my role in the program was to defend the interests of the crew, not only on the safety aspect, the operations, but also on the training. We had to design the training that is needed to qualify the astronauts. And something very unique to this vehicle, it requires only two weeks of training to qualify the astronauts, so they like it very much. Now, um, I think we need now, before we go to the, to the astronauts, a look at general uh, overall description of the ATV. Now, my understanding, which is not very large, this is facing forward, this is where the docking goes, and here we have two parts, a cargo module and a resource module. Is that right? Yes, you have to imagine that this is actually 10 meters long, so it's exactly the size of a double-decker bus of, uh, in London. The half part, we can call it the resource module, like salle des machines in French. You have the thermal control uh, supply, you have propulsion, you have uh, electricity on the solar rays, and here the most important part, the most intelligent part, the brain of the, of the vessel. And the forward part is the cargo. Part of the cargo is an unpressurized bay using the, for the fluids, the propellant and the gas, but the crew can access only the forward part, which is pressurized to access the bags, and also to control fluid supply. It's the manually open taps 
to supply water and gas. And of course, let's not forget the door, the, the, the forward part, the docking part. Now, you mentioned that part of the bay there is not pressurized. Am I right in assuming that if it's not pressurized, the astronauts do not go in there? That's true. The ATV was not designed for uh, spacewalks around, neither inside. So if there is any, anything to do outside, the, the crew cannot walk. There is no handles like they are on the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, or other parts of the space station. They can only access inside in shorts and uh, T-shirts inside the pressurized part. That part is not accessible to the crew. Now, I ask the question because what happens if there's a leak or something, you have to send somebody in there to fix it and they can't go in, then you're stuck. What is unique for this vehicle, although it's unmanned, it meets the safety requirements for human spaceflight. That means after any combination of any two failures, it is still safe. So if any, any problem, any leaks in this, in this path, it will be handled by the ground, by the expert in the CNES control center in Toulouse, and it will remain safe if the, even after one leak. Okay, I think everybody is pretty clear on the cargo uh, mission for the ATV, but there's another mission which is maybe not talked about as much. The astronauts, the three astronauts in the film we saw a moment ago mentioned it, but very, very briefly, I'd like you to elaborate. They said we need the ATV to reboost the space station. Why do we need the ATV to reboost the ISS? Actually, even at 400 kilometer altitude, there is still some atmosphere, so still air drag. So the, the space station slows down and uh, lowers the altitude. We lose about, it loses about uh, 100 meters per day. Is that because of gravity? Is that what you're saying? Because of air drag. And uh, even when the sun is very active, like it's coming in the next uh, few months, it can lose up to 2,000 meters, two kilometers per day. So we need sometimes to rise the altitude to avoid the space station to re-enter the atmosphere. Or the astronauts in the clip also mentioned another role the ATV has, and they called it debris avoidance. Now, how important is that? In fact, you know, we mentioned the forward part being the cargo, but on Kepler, most of the cargo actually is in here, in the tanks. It is not in terms of cargo supply to the space station, but it's a way to supply velocity. Using this propellant and the thrusters, ATV can, of course, ride the altitude, we mentioned that, change the attitude, but also change slightly the trajectory of the space station to avoid the debris, natural debris or artificial debris. It has been done with Jules Verne in the past, and I expect that uh, Kepler will do it also. Okay, let's turn to the crew now, because that was your, uh, your main uh, mission. We don't have a lot of time, so I'll ask you a question in two parts. I'd like to know what the role of the crew is up until and during the docking. What do they have to do, and how do they have to do it? And to help you, we got some video. So I will position myself relative to the vehicle, a bit like the crew is on board the space station. You can imagine the crew inside the Russian main uh, module, the ATV coming on the aft part. And they work manually, like you see on the screen, Peggy is holding a manual malfunction table. So they don't have a panel lighting what kind of malfunction they have, they design manually on this table what malfunction they have if there is any problem and which button they have to press and at the same time can you hold the microphone for me Yuri is using this plastic wrench ruler to, to, to put it on the video screen to look, ex to, to, to look exactly what distance is the ATV by looking at the actual angle on the TV screen. So the crew has a totally independent, manual, basic way to look at the distance and the range rate. And the, that's the way they can ensure safety, totally independent of all the electronics and the sensors. All right, that's before and during uh, uh, a docking. Now, the ATV is going to stay with the station maybe for up until six months. What is the role of the crew then? They bring cargo in and out? Is that it? Or is there more? So once they have ensured the proper docking of the ATV by trust monitoring, I, I, remind, I, I remind you that this is fully automated and controlled by Toulouse and the crew, just to add uh, other safety uh, layers. The ingress, we, can, uh, we will see probably some, some uh, video, the ingress by pushing the door, the, the ATV, and once inside they just access the, the bags, First, I'm sure they will go to the bags where there are some gifts, mail and surprises uh, given by the family. But of course, they access food, clothing, spare parts, uh, experiments, tools. And if they need to supply water and gas, they can just open manually the, the tap in the back on the control panel in order to just 
get uh, water and oxygen for the space station. All right, the, uh, the ATV is one of a number of ships that service the space station. There is the Russian Progress, and there's the US shuttle, not for too much longer, however, and there's the new Japanese HTV. Now, how would you uh, say that the ATV compares to those vessels? In few words, HTV is about the same size, but it's uh, only 15, 16 tons compared to Kepler 20 tons, and it doesn't dock to the space station, so it cannot reboost the space station. It is coming close to the space station, and the crew captures HTV flying a robotic arm and manually berth it to the US segment. But it has a big opening, so you can get a very big part goes through the opening. ATV docks like the Russian vehicle. We can say that Kepler is just like three times the size, the volume, the cargo capacity of a Russian Progress resupply vehicle. And more sophisticated? It is more sophisticated. It is more precise. That is not needed to be as precise. Can you imagine that this 20 tons vehicle docks with a precision of one centimeter when only 20 centimeter is needed? So it is not necessary for the space station, but it allows us in Europe to have the know-how for future exploration missions where we need more high, higher precision. Very good. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, my my uh, feeling is that the first astronauts, if I remember correctly, came to the space station in 2000, if I'm right. Eleven years later, would you say that we're learning to live better in space or in a more regular way? I think the crew has learned how to better organize a life on board, and I can tell you that's not easy to manage, especially to manage the, the waste. Uh, they are eager to have free volume available in the resupply ship to store the waste, because inside the space station it reduces the, 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 the way in, in the modules. But now there are six on board instead of three, so they are more efficient to work on scientific experiments. The maintenance now is better understood, and we are ready, ready to go further now. All right, the, uh, last question briefly, and I have to ask you this because everybody wants to know. You flew three times in space. I think there's one other European astronaut who logged more hours than you. What do you remember most? Is it a sight, a sound, a feeling, what? You got 30 seconds. I think the, the strongest memory I have probably for the rest of my life is the view of the Earth. I was warned by American colleagues that I may find myself cry watching at the Earth. Did you? Did you cry? And on each of my flights, even with my colleagues, we were pinching each other. Can you see the, the luck we have to be here? And I, I felt tears in my eyes. Even on the last uh, trip, after so yes, many hundreds of hours? It is so hours. moving. You know, we go around 16 times per day. The Earth is so beautiful, you fall in love with your planet and you cry. Well, I think you've inspired a whole new generation of astronauts to come follow you. Uh, and we are out of time. Thank you, uh, Jean-Francois uh, Clairvoy of ESA, the European... You can call me Billy Bob. This Billy is my nickname at NASA, yes. Okay. We hope you enjoyed that look at the ATV with uh, Jean-Francois. Many thanks to you. We The mission continues, ATV separation coming up in about four or five minutes. Before that, however, the second upper stage burn coming up in about one minute. You'll hear the DDO calling out that. So for us, it's back up to the boys in the broadcast booth. Alex, Thierry, and Antoine, gentlemen, go when you're ready. Thank you, uh, Just, and thank you very much, Jean-Francois. Very, very interesting uh, conversation with you. So, uh, for those who have uh, observed the um, the curve, uh, you can see that the numbers are moving again, which means that we have recovered the telemetry from the uh, ground station. The actual ground station being delayed, and we see and we can now monitor and see that we have the uh, shutdown of the EPS engine after the second 30 seconds uh, 30 seconds yeah 30 seconds burst so um we have here uh the uh, what we call the upper composite which is composed of the uh, eps upper stage the uh on top uh, of it the uh adapter on which is the the atv the atv is attached to this adapter and the brain uh, on the uh, circular outer part of the of the uh, EPS on top, which contains, of course, the uh, the brain, the onboard computer, the uh, inertial uh, measurement units, and all the other electronic and power supply for this uh, upper stage. You can also see that there are some uh, thrust, some burns uh, around the. Uh, around the body of the uh, upper stage, which is the uh, little uh, 
attitude control system which uh, have uh, six thrusters which allow the uh, upper stage to uh, control and orientate uh, properly the ATV before the separation. We have uh, got the signal from uh, uh, the uh, Awarua station. The Awarua station is uh, situated in uh, New Zealand and it is the last uh, station before uh, the loss of the uh, of the uh, upper stage after separation of the ATV and the upper stage which will, as I told you, re-enter into the atmosphere after it has uh, accomplished its mission with the ATV. So we are still seeing this, uh, this very last moment of this uh, mission for the ATV and after it has completed this mission the upper stage will make his uh, very last burn after having uh, avoided the uh, ATV orbit. So the DDO calls out uh, saying that the, uh, the all the maneuvers are behaving uh, perfectly, all the maneuvers are performed perfectly and perfectly on time, on target and as predicted. Separation coming up, Separation coming up Alex, in uh, just about a minute. Separation of ATV. We had the uh, upper stage burn the last upper stage burn. We've been uh, waiting for this moment. Everything carrying on. It's been a very emotional moment, as you know. The uh, ATV, a huge project for Europe, for Europe, uh, involving uh, a lot of time and a lot of effort for uh, many, many people. Separation time is one hour, three minutes, and fifty-four seconds. That's in just a minute. We'll be over the Tasmanian Sea. Picking up where I assume we're still being picked up by the uh, Perth, the Adelaide station and the, uh, and the uh, New Zealand station, which is, I can never pronounce. <laughs> then we'll have time after separation to talk about the ATV-3, I hope, Un unless you've already gone over that. In preparation for the next uh, flight, which is in uh, some month. Everything normal. A little bit of tension here in the hall as all eyes are gazing forward onto the computer screens waiting, for the, waiting for the GDO to call out the last orientations of the composite of the Johannes Kepler to reach the mission, proper orbit the ATV 2 Ariane Spaces 200th mission Separation d'ATV de Johannes Kepler Well, there we are, the, the hall bursting into applause here and smiling faces all around. Successful mission. The ATV Kepler on her way now. In about a week, she should be up joining the ISS for all the docking maneuvers that uh, my friend Jean-Francois Clairvoy described. This is the way it looks up there. She's pushed away from the mothership. It's a series of springs like with all the other commercial satellites, or is it a different bit there? Yes, so the springs which are uh, which are pushing the uh, the the ATV, and uh, we'll have a first of a couple of launch replays. You can relive those moments uh, about an hour ago, as Ariane left the ground here in French Guiana. All right, Alex, what what happens to the launcher now? So the, the upper stage has accomplished its uh, main mission, which was the separation of the ATV on its, uh, on its orbit. Now it maneuvers. Second replay coming up, Alex, and we'll be back. We'll be back, more. okay. Let's uh, enjoy. That replay with no sound, but you saw the pictures, beautiful pictures. We didn't think we were going to have uh, good pictures tonight because of the rain, but the sky cleared and we had some marvelous shots of Ariane leaving. So you, uh, Ariane's uh, final uh, phase, uh, so what the, happened? Uh, as you can see on the, on the screen, the upper stage maneuvers so as to uh, avoid the uh, orbit of the ATV. Now, this, this happens on, on every flight. It's much the same situation, am I right? Yes, after we have separated each satellite, of course, uh, we maneuver the upper stage in order not to, to get as far as possible from the, uh, the separated bodies. And 
and then it'll uh, it'll uh, stay on ballistic phase, but Mr. Legal is... Mr. Legal is approaching the podium to begin the post-launch speeches. Jean-Yves Legal. Madam Minister, dear friends, as you have just seen, Europe has again be, been extremely successful with the perfect orbiting of ATV-2 UNS Kepler by Iron-5. This launch was exceptional. First of all, it was the 200th launch of an Ariane, so a very important step for uh, Europe of space. Then it was the second time that Europe contributed to the servicing of the ISS. And last but not least, it was the first of the 12 launches that INS Pass has planned to carry out this year, nine in the CSG and three in Baikonur. So let me warmly thank all the representatives of the member states who have watched this launch, in particular those who have honored us in joining us today in the CSG. I would also like to congratulate and thank the Director General of ESA for his determination to conduct a space policy that can make each European citizen proud, because this success is the success of Europe as a whole, Germany and DLR that has always supported and actively participated in the manned space flights and that in 95 has been at the origin of the ATV. Italy and ASI that is playing a major role in the station and it's an Italian astronaut that next week will uh, welcome ATV on the station and France and CNES that have developed the launcher Ariane 5 ES and manage with ESA the operations of uh, orbit of the ATV and of course all the other European states. This success is the success of Astrium and the European space industry that have developed the most complex space vehicle ever developed in Europe and made the launcher that has orbited it uh, so they've joined the club of the major players. This success is again uh, the success of the uh, CSG that confirms it's now part of the exclusive club with Baikonur, Cape Canaveral and Tanegashima of the, Europe, uh, of the space centers servicing the station. It's clear that the quality of its facilities and the quality of the surroundings uh, that our partners find in Guyana uh, contribute to this success. The success, last but not least, is that of Ariane Espace that has coordinated all the operations having led to this launch that was the 42nd launch in a row of Ariane 5 and the first perfect launch in less than three and a half months. Madam Minister, if you remember, when I invited you to attend this launch on the 1st of October, I told you that we would launch again three Ariane 5 in 2010 and ATV2 in February. That's what we've just done. And uh, it took us another day, but I mean, uh, we did it. And thanks, and this thanks to the professionalism, the commitment, and the efficiency of the operational team of Ariane Espace that is today organizing the Ariane 5 launches, and that in a few months will organize those of Soyuz and Vega. You've met many of our customers, or I've met many of our customers over the past few weeks, and I can tell you that the whole world is envying us today. And let's applaud all of this. Now our mission is over, but we will follow together the progression of ATV-2 Johannes Kepler until the deployment of its solar panels. In the meantime, I've got the great pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Jean-Jacques Dordain, General Director General of ESA, and Madame Valérie Pécresse, Minister of uh, uh, University and Research. Once again, thank you very much and congratulations. Dear friends, Madam Minister, uh, I should be short because uh, Jean-Yves said that Ariane has uh, completed its mission. ATV is uh, starting its mission and I have to go with my colleagues uh, who are uh, looking at the ATV. Uh, but uh, already at that point, we can say that uh, this is a new success for Ariane and a uh, new success for uh, all of those who are contributing to the Ariane program.
Today we can speak of the 200 uh, launch of Ariane. Yesterday I was afraid. I was right yesterday to say that to launch at 1913 was not uh, a, was not a good hour. 6:50 is much better, and uh, that just to demonstrate that uh, no success is given for granted. You have to force the success, and uh, and I'm I must say that those who have forced the success are uh, are clearly today the engineers and the technicians who have worked. Uh, since uh, last night to make sure that we can launch uh, uh, tonight. And I would like to thank all of them, be they from uh, Ariane Espace, uh, from industry, uh, from uh, CNES, and even my colleagues of the Directorate of Launcher of ESA. They have spent a lot of time to make sure that uh, we could launch the uh, Johannes Kepler uh, today, and I would like to thank them very, very, very much. I think that uh, this is... This is your day, and, uh, and I would like to, again, to, to thank you for that. Uh, uh, I would like just to confirm that uh, you have seen a launch from ground, but this is true that I, we got Paolo Despoli live on uh, our mobile uh, 10 minutes ago, and the, uh, the crew of the space station, they, uh, they have started to see the launch on TV, and they rushed to the cupola, uh, brought by Europe, by the way, uh, last year. And they have seen uh, the launcher from, uh, from the space station. And they have taken pictures. So you will get pictures not only uh, of that launch from ground, but also pictures from, uh, from the space station. And I think that uh, this is not so uh, uh, often that uh, you can get pictures from uh, uh, the ground and, and from space. So it's a... It's a success, and I would like to thank, obviously, the member states. I think that uh, all that uh, would not exist without the member states. I have uh, thanks also the engineers and the technicians. I would like just maybe a word for the, uh, for the ones, the golden uh, oldies uh, who were at the, at the start of Ariane. And uh, there is some of these pioneers uh, today in, uh, in, uh, with you. And uh, I see uh, Monsieur Grageux, who was present at the first council of, uh, of ISA. So uh, he has attended all council of ISA. Uh, and uh, I think that he is unique. Uh, and there is Peter Creola also, uh, uh, who has started also, but uh, who is not anymore now in the council. Why, why Henrik is, uh, is still in the council. Thank you also to you. Uh, because uh, you have been at the beginning, and uh, if we are here today, it's also thank, thanks to you. So uh, this is uh, uh, a first step for ATV. We are far from uh, saying that uh, this is a success for the ATV. Success will be declared in six months from now, so uh, uh, when, when the mission is, is completed. Uh, but the mission will start, uh, is starting now, and in the now less than 30 minutes, uh, the uh, solar panels will, uh, will be deployed. And when the solar panels are deployed, we have uh, power on board and uh, we can, uh, the real business can start. And uh, after that, as you know, there will be uh, the rendezvous and docking, which is now scheduled on uh, the 24th of uh, February. And uh, Paolo Nespoli will welcome, uh, will welcome uh, Johannes Kepler uh, on board the ISS uh, uh, next week. So thank you very much. Uh, and now uh, I shall go with my colleagues uh, of ATV because uh, the work is starting for, uh, for them. And I would like to be with them. Thank you very much.
Merci, cher Jean-Yves Le Gall. Merci, cher Jean-Jacques. Thank Gall. you, dear Jean-Yves Le Gall. Thank you, dear Jean-Jacques Dordain, for all those emotions tonight. And um, what I'd like to say, I think I also speak on behalf of my colleague, uh, uh, Marcy Van. I'd, I'd like to say that uh, it's, a, it's a great pride for France, for Europe, to have uh, to have experience that to see that Ariane today is really a reference to see that the European space industry is capable of designing such a sophisticated space cargo as uh, the ATV. Uh, well, actually, the flight was delayed 24 hours, but it made things even more dramatic. Um, um, see, when I came, I said, well, it works every time. It's really some things so usual 200th flight but when you see that um, it has to be postponed and you you feel the the tension the stress that the team feels every time i guess and uh, you know you're in a state of shock and you, you you're afraid of failure and um, so it gave us even more um, the feeling of happiness uh, uh, today after the success i'd like to congratulate all the teams of CNES, uh, ESA, um, of all the uh, member states, all the engineers and technicians of the space industry who took part in that wonderful adventure, the operational teams of Ariane Space that we are going to be congratulating in a few minutes. I know that they've really worked so hard to make sure that everything would be uh, repaired uh, in within 24 hours. I'm really happy because I stayed on purpose just to see that liftoff, and I'm really, really happy to see that it's a, a wonderful success. So this is a very promising year, a very promising year for Centre Spatial Guyane because there will be a lot of launches, uh, Soyuz very soon, I hope, and also soon uh, Vega. So this is a wonderful year, 2011, which is starting under the best auspices. So congratulations. Bravo, and thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Merci, Monsieur le Directeur Général. Thank you. Thank you, Director General. Thank you, the Chairman of uh, CNES. And I would like also to thank the uh, team in charge of the weather forecast, because the weather's great. The weather's beautiful. The uh, uh, weather parameter was green. Uh, I know it was a bit difficult to believe that today, you know, with all those uh, showers. But anyway, that was great. Uh, and they helped us uh, uh, succeed. So next, uh, we will meet again on the 29th of March for a new IN5 uh, launch, and this time a YASAT-1A for the United Arab Emirate, one of the biggest satellites in the world, and new dawn for Intelsat and Africa. Thank you and good evening. Successfully delivering the ATV-2, we're going to close with a recap, a film of some of the major Ariane launches over the years. But stay with us because ESA's Yo Joachim Ebi, uh, the ATV development part of that team, it will be with us. And uh, my friend Jean-Francois Clairvoy will be with the French. We'll be back with solar panel deployment in half an hour.
fill, and then we do the interviewing. Okay. We are we have we, we have closed the first part of the broadcast. Ariane uh, five has successfully delivered, as you saw the second in the series of the ATV cargo ships. And what we're doing now is we're waiting for the final elements of the ATV uh, mission. This is the ESA part of the broadcast, I guess, because the Arian uh, part is over. We're waiting for solar panel deployment. So Alex, before we do that, give us a rundown of how you saw the mission tonight. Uh, it's, I have done several missions with the ESA. I've uh, had the. I was lucky enough to be a program director for Rosetta. I was here with you, Josh, for I remember uh, Herschel that. Planck. I remember. And that. it's always a huge emotion to uh, to participate uh, to uh, these kind of missions. The scientific missions are very different. All missions are exciting. The scientific missions are a little different. I agree uh, with you. Particularly uh, different from the uh, usual ones, I would say. However, our job is not a usual one, as you know. And it's, uh, it's for each flight, it's a, it, it, each flight is a different flight, a different emotion and different uh, situations to face. So how did you see the countdown? We had a, a flawless countdown today, picture-perfect launch, and a letter-perfect uh, countdown before that. Yes, uh, everything has been fixed uh, from yesterday's uh, anomaly. That was, uh, they, they found the wood cause and uh, they uh, actually the teams uh, worked uh, all night long to fix the problem and to resume the operation this morning uh, because uh, when the uh, launcher is uh, aborted then we have to uh, flush the lines we cannot uh, keep the uh, liquid hydrogen and oxygen inside the tanks and we have to uh, flush them back to uh, to the ground tanks so it takes hours before we can uh, be back into a safe configuration for the launcher and uh, the satellite. So uh, tip of the hat to the teams who worked uh, probably all night. They worked all night, absolutely. And uh, they, yes, we can thank them as uh, Jean-Jacques Dordain did uh, for, the, for the work that they achieved. The launch uh, was without a hitch. Ariane successfully uh, delivering and turning over the uh, mission now to ATVCC, I imagine, huh, in Toulouse, which is uh, what we have uh, on the screen. Yes. They, they will assume control, and are, are they the ones, are they the teams that are going to uh, be monitoring the solar panel deployment? Yes, and uh, you see Jean-Jacques Dordain is now uh, close to uh, the uh, DMS, the uh, Satellite Mission Director, Nico Detman. Right. He's with his team. Uh, waiting for the uh, for the, the uh, different uh, activations that will be performed by the ATV, and monitoring that everything is uh, is performing as planned. Now the solar panel deployment due to begin at one hour and twenty eight minutes after launch. Where are we? That's in about four minutes. That's three uh, minutes to go, right? Yeah, three minutes to go, and uh, I guess that uh, there is a. Some tension in the uh, Mission Control Center in Toulouse. And we might have a direct link with them coming up. Shall, shall we bring in Joachim Ebi, who, who is here with us? You, you, you are from ESA's uh, ATV development team, is that right? Yes. Yes. Greetings to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So we, we, we are waiting for solar panel deployment, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Now, why is solar de panel deployment coming up at this, it seems to me, an early point in the launch? And why is it taking so long? No, it comes so late, uh, so early because we are running on batteries, and uh, we have only two hours batteries. So we have to immediately get the solar so to return the power, because if we don't get it out in the next two hours, uh, we are running out of power. Uh, so, so the batteries on board the ATV can only provide power for for two hours. For two hours. That means two orbits. Two orbits. So you're right. The solar panels. Uh, rather important. Yes. Now, how, how important is, is, is the launch window? Uh, well, there was no launch window, but, but the launch time is gauged towards getting the payload, the ATV, in a position where the solar panels can be deployed and receive energy from the sun. Am I correct? Is that a, there's a calculation there. Is that right? Uh, you don't look like I'm saying that right. <laughs> Ex explain it. I explain the explain the relationship between the uh, the fixed orbit time and the solar panel deployment for us. Ah, you mean the the fixed orbit time now where we are? Okay. <clears throat> 
so what do you do now? What do you do now? You, uh, you employ them and you start immediately to go to uh, your steering, earth pointing, to uh, adjust the solar rays and the sun to recharge the battery. That's what you do now. Because the ATV will go in attitude control. In the attitude control is your steering. Mm -hmm. And you start immediately with the computer to align the solar rays to the sun to get the power back. I see. Okay. So you have to do this before uh, yes. two hours. Yes, because now, it, it, otherwise, otherwise you run out of, of power. Okay. Was this, uh, you, was this the role that you played in development of the ATV? Did, did you work particularly on this subject, or did you work on another aspect? No, I was, in, I was avionics. I was involved in, in, in avionics. Avionics. Okay. Well, tell, tell us about that, then. Tell us what you did. The avionics is what? Is it the propulsion systems? Uh, the avionics is a quite, uh, let's say, quite a complex mechanism here, because it uh, contains of computers, uh, let's say, acquisition units, sensors, gyros, GPS, and, uh, of course, the whole system is built up to be two failure tolerant. So that means you have three computers, you have uh, on board. On board three computers. The three computers are doing the same software, doing exactly the same, and they have a voting concept. When you say they're doing the same, does that mean they're what's the word redundant or they're, they're redundant, backups? They're redundant and voting and voting the results. Mm -hmm. And if one computer let's say disagree, he gets automatically voted out. Mm -hmm. So that means you go then from three to two computer system. But Okay. We're going to have, uh, we'll be back with more from uh, Joachim, part of the ATV uh, development team. We're going to go in a minute to an interview we had with uh, Bernard Cabriere down there in uh, Toulouse. He's assistant director of operations at Kness Toulouse. I think you'll find this interesting because he told about some of the experiences on the ATV development. Back with more. Well, first of all, thank you uh, to our friends from uh, Kourou and uh, the ones working on the launches for having positioned that uh, second uh, big baby of the ATV family. I believe uh, we'll get to see them uh, often this year because uh, at the end of the summer we'll position also the two Galileo spacecraft from Toulouse on the first Soyuz launch and with our colleagues uh, from ESOP. And at the end of the year, uh, we'll get ready to launch the third ATV Pleiad and the four ELISA satellites uh, also in Kourou. So see you soon, Kourou. ATV is a very complex vehicle. Uh, only by its size, 20 tons, 10 meters, it's quite huge. And also, those are operations we're not used to. Docking onto a manned flight, a dialogue between three control centers. So with Jules Verne, we had to fine-tune all of that, and it was very hard work for all the teams to design that system. Since uh, Jules Verne, we worked a lot to confirm that uh, brilliant success and to do something that would be durable because we'll have five vehicles to launch. So we worked on making hardware, software, networks uh, more robust, and we worked on training teams uh, because uh, uh, our uh, launches will be uh, uh, less uh, spaced out. So we will be developing a training academy to already uh, succeed in that uh, docking, that positioning uh, with uh, Johannes Kepler. And then uh, when uh, docking is completed, we'll start a training third uh, ATV Eduardo Almaldi, which will be launched uh, next year. All right, that's uh, Bernard Cabrier, Assistant Director of Operations at uh, CNES Toulouse. We have another interview coming up uh, in about uh, two or three more minutes with a project manager for the ATV operations at CNES, someone you probably know, Joachim uh, Marshall Van Hoof. I'm sure you've worked with him. So we're going to be hearing from him in a moment. But for now, car carry on, uh, unless you had a question, Alex, or, or sh shall we continue uh, with the... I had a question for Joachim. So, uh, uh, Go ahead. The, how much time does it take uh, to develop uh, the uh, ATV uh, program, such a huge and complex program? No. Well, approximately. I mean, it's not, it's not a five or ten years program. It's no, we probably started, more than that. We started in 95 with the first ATV-95. For Jules Verne? We, the, AT, the first study was done with ATV-95, where it was called Ariane Transfer Vehicle. Not automated, it was... Same, in, same initials. Yeah, ATV. but it, same initials, but it was a Ariane Transfer Vehicle. It was 95, even before we had study, so... And that's, that's before the space station was up. Yes, right. it was uh, it was a type of a generic Ariane Transfer Vehicle. And then, uh, I think, after... But, you, excuse me, used to be... To, to transfer what? From uh, what to what? 
they say it was to, uh, it was to transfer, let's say, let's say cargo to the station because you know ah. it, we we built here an MTFF, we built the Columbus, we had a huge program. Okay. So, uh, but the real program, the real program started in 98, 98, 98, 99, we started development. Okay. Back with more from uh, Joachim with a very interesting uh, uh, looking back on the ATV, which started, you said, in 1995, so it was launched 13 years later. Yes. So we'll get back to that, but we're going to go to our second interview. Marshall uh, Van Hove, project manager for ATV operations, also with CNES. We're back with Joachim and Alex while we're waiting for solar panel deployment. Now that the ATV has been separated, been separated from the launcher, the, the role of the ATV CC really starts. We've been waiting for this moment for a month. The control center will now take the hand over the vehicle. We will first make sure that this separation and the first automatic activities on board the ATV go on fine, that the configuration is correct, that the solar panels deploy, communication masts deploy as well. Then we'll move the vehicle, activating its uh, thrusters to an orbit that will slowly, day after day, in a eight to eight, eight, eight days, make it to the station for our final rendezvous. We will use uh, these eight days to finalize the preparation of the vehicle for this uh, rendezvous with the two main activities, select the thrusters, a group of engines that uh, would allow us, in case of danger during the approach phase, to take the ATV away from the station as quickly as possible. And besides, we will finalize the mechanical preparation to guarantee this rendezvous with the station. Once docked onto the station, the ATV will play its role of cargo ship, uh, providing services to the station, among other things. It will control the station altitude, increasing it from time to time. It will deliver fuel. Uh, it's uh, used uh, for this purpose as well, and eventually pull away from the station and be destroyed above the South Pacific with the waste uh, the crew will have put on board. This is the last phase of the mission. It's not as noble, maybe, but it is as necessary. Joachim uh, Ebi of ISA, you said you, you were on the link with the ATV CC Toulouse, which is on the right-hand part of your screen, and you said that you heard the confirmation of the beginning of the solar panel the deployment. All right, so that takes how long? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Why does it take so long? Yeah. Why? Uh, because the solar arrays are, let's say, it, but by, it's, it's a box called TCU, it's a solar control unit. There are four TCUs. And the, the T so, a TCO, sorry, is what? It's a, it's a thermal control unit. Thermal TCU, control unit. Yeah. And we have four TCUs. The TCUs get the order from the computer, and the TCUs will start. The bins of solar arrays you are locked in, they have springs, and they are thermal knives. So you have thermal knives, and you deploy it. And of course, it takes time to deploy four different unique solar arrays up to the Estonia. That takes in total 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Yeah. And all that's being monitored by By tools. Yeah, because uh, what we have now, we have also no telemetry via the TDSS, so they can monitor the telemetry data to see that the solar is up perfect uh, deployed. Good. T T D T D T D S has to take the tracking and data satellite. Yeah. That's T the GPS. Uh, that's the NASA. It's fleet. a NASA. It's a NASA. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a semi-commercial fleet now, isn't it, or is it still? It's, it's, it's commercial. It's, it's commercial. In, in the old days, it was uh, pure NASA, but now it's commercialized. Mm -hmm. So the ATV data are sent via T D S S to White Sand, and from White Sand via these are linked to Toulouse. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. called I G S. So that is. I had another question? question for our Jump guests. in any time. Uh, Joachim, uh, w what was the, uh, how did you manage the, uh, the contribution of the, uh, the U.S. and the Russians in the, uh, designing the, the ATV? Yeah, because you have not, not only, that's a good question, you have not only scientific uh, challenges, but maybe cultural challenges because the Russians are good at things and you have to, it's like uh, Jean-Francois Clairvoy had to design, uh, had to design the uh, failure of the malfunction chart for Russians, Europeans and Americans. Did you encounter the same sort of, uh, I won't say problems, but issues? No, I think with the Russian, in the beginning the problem with the Russian was the language barrier because uh, all the meetings have been done in two languages so we have for every meeting we have translators. It's not deployed. Yeah. Ah, from the look of things, yeah. We may have successfully solar panel deployment. Right, People are, Mr. Legal is uh, yeah. clapping. You seem to think so, you, yeah. Joachim. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear something on the... No, the back, but I guess from the, from the reaction. I didn't hear something in the, in the voice. 
qui se déchargeait très rapidement sans les panneaux solaires. Et à partir du moment où on a la puissance à bord, je dois dire que maintenant nous pouvons contrôler le, la TV. Donc euh, ça n'est pas encore fini, mais le bébé, le bébé se porte bien. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Jean-Jacques Dordain saying that uh, we can now recharge the batteries, as Joachim said, because we now have the energy coming from the solar panels, the four solar panels, four solar panels. which uh, are, are successfully uh, arrayed now. So uh, the pretty much entire functioning ATV yes. is on its way. For uh, the next eight days, uh, she'll be trying to catch up yeah. with the ISS, ISS. 22,000 kilometers ahead of it. Yeah. I think. And then she has to raise up about another 100 uh, kilometer. 100 kil kilometers, is yeah. that, is that yeah. the figure? That takes time. Yeah. Okay. Just a couple of, uh, before we leave you, just a couple of things. Uh, you started to talk about the cultural differences now. I think that's interesting. Go ahead. You said there's always the translators at the Russian on the Russian side. Yeah, because. Uh, that slows that things down, I guess, huh? Yeah. In meetings. I think the Russian, has, uh, I think they have a great history in space, but uh, they had another way to do it like we did. Yeah. So we have to find ourselves together, let's say, to have two different cultures, how to make space out of it. And I think uh, ITV shows that we successfully reached the goal. Yeah. I think you're right. ITV yeah. shows that we yeah. successfully... Uh, For example, the, the, the docking adapter they have, the, the Russian docking adapter, when it was presented to us, it was um, a very old design relay logic for the wash machine, really logic, very, but uh, we could not uh, put this in ATV from, from the weight, from the volume, it was boxes, boxes, let's say half a cubic meter. But, but it's, a system, it's a system that worked. Yeah, 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 yeah but we, it was for ATV, it means from the size, from the volume, so I we see. did a redesign, which is called REX, it's Russian electronic system, so we redesigned with the Russian the complete uh, docking adapter. Uh -huh. We have now an electronic type, uh, which is quite more sophisticated. Because the old one was not uh, possible to install the old one in ATP. Mm -hmm. So we did a couple of redesigns on the Russian hardware. Yeah. And yeah, we, we, we have the, the same kind of experience on the rocket side because we are now working for Soyuz and we have also the Russian teams here. And I must say that uh, working in such a multicultural uh, context is really very exciting. It's exciting, it's not easy, but it's very fulfilling, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah, a typical example is uh, we found out Russian Russian have uh, almost had very low experience in designing in vacuum. Okay, we're going to think. All right, we're going to leave you, I think, uh, with everything uh, successfully uh, accomplished. Thank you to Joachim Ebi from the ATV development team at ESA. Uh, any last words, Alex? Well, my last words will be that, uh, as I told you, it's, uh, each flight is a uh, new emotion. I heard Jean-Francois say that he would cry at each, uh, each time amazing, he sees yeah. the Earth from, uh, from space. Something. Huh? I wouldn't cry, but uh, I Almost. really feel... Almost. We're going really to leave, leave you before Alex uh, breaks into tears here. <laughs> the, the next launch, I think uh, Mr. Gal said, is at the end of March. We'll be here. We hope you will be too. Joshua Jampo with Alex Madimbasi. Thanks for being with us. Goodbye, we hope you enjoyed everyone. it. See you next time. See you next time.